Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Manscaped has the revolutionary electric trimmer, the Lawnmower 3.0. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it's guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts or your chest because you can use it upstairs and downstairs. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have a guest from all the way on the other side of the globe in one of my favorite countries in the world, Italy. It is Valentina Nappi. Valentina, how are you? I'm good. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it's um, getting late where you are, whereas for me, it's like it's fine. the morning. So we're on like totally different trajectories. I'm like still waking up, but, um, I really appreciate you coming on. I've had a lot of people ask me for you, so I'm glad I could make their dreams come true. (laughs) Well, thank you for inviting me. It was funny. I think I told you I went to Italy. I'm so glad we did this. We went to Italy October last year, and that was like our last big trip before the coronavirus hit. And I feel so grateful now that we made that trip. Um, but I, I went to Italy, which I had been to before, and I brought my husband, who had never actually left like the continental United States before. Yeah, that's really common in the United States. Yeah. So it was this incredible, incredible trip. I just love your country so much. But one of the funny things, and this should come as no surprise to you, is that whenever I encountered somebody who, for some reason or another, I told them what I did for a living, they always asked about you. Yeah, I'm really famous leader. I mean, I don't have much competition over here, so it's, <laughs> it's kind of easy. And also, uh, I did a TED Talk in Italy. I used to write for, I mean, I still have the blog on economics and politics um, journal, which is called Micromega. I feel like in Europe, uh, performers have more freedom. They have more space to to speak about porn or just to you know have different ideas i've done really heavy uh provocation that's how you say provocative i've I've said really provocative things things that i i don't think i could afford to say in the united states because they will probably cancel me if if i go that far you know like in italy people are more open uh but I, I, f- I kind of feel like there's more freedom of speech over here than over there. Do you mean by, you don't mean by the government, right? You just mean like a cult- no, no, I mean in a by cultural so, way. So the cult, yeah, like in, you know, if you do certain things in the United States, uh, I don't know, you will lose your job or people on social media will like start to hate you so much that you will feel like you can't log in anymore. Stuff like that. I feel like in Italy, I mean, I had feminists and conservatives who are really heavy on me, but at the end, you know, I always win. <laughs> like, <laughs> I guess they'll say whatever the hell I want, you know. It, it's almost like over there, people are more open to listen to both sides of the argument rather than just being so entrenched in their own beliefs and everything that everybody else says is wrong. Yeah. And I think there's more vitriol. people are more open to think about think about morality in general like you know i feel like in the united states it's more or oh, you're rather conservative or you let people do whatever they want mm-hmm. and maybe in, in europe we ask a little bit more often what is right and what is wrong so people are more flexible yeah i mean there's cancel culture is definitely rife in our society right now and i feel like to- this really america at least it's really united states i don't yeah. see i don't see in other countries go as heavy as united states with uh, cancer culture and i find it totally ridiculous yeah no you're absolutely right there's we're a very angry country right now 
Like, you have all the reason to be uh, yeah. <laughs> angry, but you have to put the angerness you in, mean? you know, in the right in the right direction. Otherwise, uh, you know, you don't get anything. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that I think a lot. I think where a media deflects our anger. I think we're angry about the wrong things. Um, you know, the the real problems. I mean, there's so many problems that, that we have, but a lot of people forget like the disparity between incomes and like the widening gap between poverty and wealth, I think is a huge problem here. And, um, that's, you know, our, our horrible healthcare system. These are all really big issues intrinsic to, our our government and you know things that we need to focus on basically like honestly things that like bernie sanders has been saying this whole time which is why i really wish that he had gotten the nomination for the democratic party but um i guess he was too progressive but you know the media deflects our attention onto like oh you should be angry about this and be angry about what trump what said here yeah be angry about political correctness and you know there's something to be said for, for all of those things. But I do think that a lot of times our, our, our anger is, is misdirected into places that aren't really going to move us forward as a country. And, um, we get easily distracted by stupid shit. So it's happening in Italy too. Yeah. I just what is feel your, yeah. What is your climate like, especially with, you know, coronavirus and all of that. I saw Tara Patrick, you know, who's living in Italy mention that you guys, your cases are going up, even though, um, every, you know, masks are still enforced and, and all of that. Is that, no, is that true? I see. A, I mean, I don't know if it's just in the South, but I see a lot of people, um, uh, mean, they'll wear a mask, but they will, uh, do a lot of private parties and certain occasion they will not wear a mask. So that's why the cases are going up. Also, everybody uh, in August came in, in the South for holidays. Right. I mean, I mean it's for vacation. And, um, and then, you know, now they're going back to their houses, probably in the North and all over Italy. And Campania right now has one of the highest number of cases in Italy. Mm -hmm. And they're really uh, locking up certain cities. So we will see how it will end. <laughs> but do you feel, I mean, could, well, actually, you haven't been back to the U.S. since the quarantine, obviously, right? You've been I, I, I felt so lucky that I was able, I got in the plane, I got, I got into in the last plane directly to Italy. Really? I booked it, I booked it like six hours before. They shut and that I down. canceled a bunch of shoots too. I was like, I don't want to be stuck here without working. That's insane. I, yeah. I need to go home right now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you got really, really lucky. It was eight hundred uh dollars one way economy. But yeah. uh, hey, at least I did the quarantine here. Let's talk about let's talk about the adult industry. Um, you've been a very popular performer for a while now do you want to tell us how you got into the industry so i uh, i researched for like a year i was going around to kind of sex pos that we have in italy but they are really bad they're not like avian they're really bad i mean i'm not a big fan of avian expo yeah <laughs> but it's well done it's but it's a pain in the ass to go to is i'm so happy you know the are, are they doing it next year? No. They're doing a virtual AVN, which I have no idea how that's going to work. Um, I Like, I'm really interested to see how that, how they're going to manage that. Like, I mean, I'm anyway. mad at them because they never gave me a uh, foreign performer of the year anyway. And I mean, right now I have competition, but there's, in the past I told totally deserve it and they didn't give it to me. So it makes you feel any better. I've never won an AVN award either. So what? Are you serious? I'm dead serious. Okay, then uh, fuck them. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're one of the know. best photographers in the business that make Thank zero you. sense. Thank you. Well, they don't have a they don't have a photography award, 
so oh, okay yeah but yeah. you are a director too and you've been a director for a long yeah. time yeah yeah but there's a lot of directors that are better than me to, i mean honestly but whatever it doesn't matter yeah. i don't care uh why would we end up talking about that you uh think? you were talking about how you got into the industry and how oh, you started yes. doing different so um so uh, uh yeah i rock around for a while and then i decided to write an email to rockus of freddy and after a while, we shot POV in Rome, and then I went to his set in Budapest. How is it like working with him? Because he is one of the, you know, most legendary male performers, and I know that he's a, he's too much for some people, but some people really love working with him. So, how was your experience? I think he's too much for people now. I feel like. Performers of my generation are are different. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, there's a lot of girls. They do porn, but I feel like they shouldn't be in porn because mm -hmm. they're too delicate. You know, porn is not like having sex in the bedroom with your boyfriend, and it shouldn't mm -hmm. be because we are we should be professionals. So I think mm -hmm. if you have too many boundaries, like you're not open to explore your sexuality, to upgrade your sexuality, to change your sexuality, I don't think you should do porn. I met I've met girls in porn that didn't want to have cum in their faces, and I'm like, why do you even? What's do wrong that? with you? <laughs> it's not, you know, I understand if some, I'm I know I'm not into pain. I've never done uh, I've shot for kink only, uh, all butt stuff and something else, mm -hmm. light bondage. I've never done uh, heavily bondage thing because I'm not submissive. Uh, I'm I don't like pain. For me, that's mm -hmm. just painful. I don't have an enjoyment out of it so i don't i don't shoot that type of stuff mm -hmm. but i'm not gonna complain for you know some light uncomfortable <laughs> positions or or things like i'll do it and if something is new i'll I'll be open to try it like yeah sure let's let's mm -hmm. try it actually thanks to porn i've discovered so much about my sexuality mm -hmm. and so yeah, when I show with Rocco, I've never licked fit. I never framed anyone. So it was my first time with him. And I just, it was like a dance that he just, he was just, uh, you know, like showing me how to dance. And I was learning new things about myself and about sex. Mm -hmm. Especially because, so, you know, how Italians men are. I, I think, I mean, they're I, I realize they're less like you know I just, when i went to united states uh i feel like you guys are more homophobic one time i heard a performer say that if you prefer do anal with a girl than vaginal sex then it's because you're gay yeah we definitely are very we're quite homophobic in this country for sure and they're not really into rimming or maybe they are but they will not do it on camera and i'm yeah. like okay you don't have bidet so that's fine i'm not <laughs> a bidet is something that is definitely missing in our culture and it's funny when you when you go to european countries almost everybody has one and it's always hilarious no, the french they invented it but they don't have it oh is that true yeah i haven't been to france in so long i mean i think we find especially in this i i find any other all the Japanese are cleaner than us, and the Japanese Muslim countries. That's it. Then all the others are like kind of dirty, but it's like okay, I do porn, I ring people, I I've licked a, a prolapse, so it's it's oh. fine. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> that, that was like and the roaches too. So you actually I mean, what? I breed mice. Oh, okay. Like, and roaches so i can't be that germophobic you know yeah but you're not but i was really germophobic when i got into porn yeah it, it always makes me laugh when um i shot a girl the other day who said she was like germophobic and and you know it was a real problem for her and i was kind of like that's interesting considering what you do for a living because you're definitely exposing yourself to a lot of different bodily fluids and stuff like that so i mean you know granted everybody on set is, is quite clean, but still, you know, if that's, if that's a thing, that's uh that's gotta be tough to navigate. So, um, 
Anyways, okay, so we totally went off subject. Okay, so you work for Rocco. Um, you learned a lot working for him, and you tried a lot of new things, which you said you were you were very open to. And then what happened from there? And then I just start to work for different companies. And then I realized that, you know, I want to come to United States uh, because uh, over there is different. Um, you guys shoot more. LA produces 80% of porn worldwide. Yeah, that sounds about I right. I read the statistics, but I don't know how much is true. I think it's, I think it's true. I think a big part of it is, well, first of all, California is one of the only states besides, I got to fucking make sure I have this right. I think it's Massachusetts. Um, where porn is technically legal everywhere else. It's kind of like a weird gray area. And that has to do with like the, That's the other the thing court. in Europe is kind of legal everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually because of the Freeman case, um, which is a whole other story. It porn is technically legal in California where it's not so that's, it's kind of not been addressed in other States. Um, and then also this is obviously the production hub of the world pretty much because of Hollywood. So we have access to, you know, all the camera people and locations and equipment rentals and stuff that would be very difficult to find in other places. So, but yeah, that sounds about right. 80%. That would make sense. Okay. I thought they would totally separate the world. So people actually go back and forth. Yeah. It comes to cameras and equipment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. you just don't say it because mm -hmm. yeah, there's so much stigma. Even a makeup artist, if she does so much more. That's so that in Italy, even if someone is against porn, they will never go after a makeup artist or don't hire a makeup artist just because she's done yeah. makeup or porn set. This, that's really I, nice. I have a couple of assistants who you've met, um, you know, who don't want to be on camera and uh, don't want to have their names associated with it. Not because they personally have a problem with it, but they also work for companies like Disney and Nickelodeon. And if they found out what you did for a living, they would not hire you. In fact, I have a girl who I shot for Playboy who was very softcore. She didn't do any open leg or anything like that. And she's been bugging me to try to get her content taken down off of Playboy Plus because she got offered like an acting, she got the possibility of getting like an acting gig for like, a, I think a kid's show that might be on like Nickelodeon or Disney and she won't get the job if they find out that she did Playboy. Like that's how crazy the stigma is. And I feel so bad for her because, you know, and Playboy took down her content, but like her, it's still out there. I mean, you know, once things on yeah. the internet, can't get it off. And so she's probably not going to get this gig because she did some like super tasteful nudes for Playboy that I shot and the pictures were fucking So it's just beautiful. nudes. There's not even just no, nudes, not, not even open leg, no masturbation, not even open leg, like super tame, but she still, she won't get the job because she did it. I Isn't think in Italy, it will be all your problem if you are a teacher and yeah. you have kids. Yeah. Well, it is a kid's show. So I think that's what it is. But again, it's just but like, this is just nudes. I know. And, but, and it's but like glamour. Even, yeah. It's glamour and it's nudes. It's like, it just, it, I don't know. I don't understand. I don't understand where that, that idea comes from. Like, like a glamour shoot. So I don't think it would be a problem. In Italy. You know, if you've been a, a Playboy model and then you become, yeah, an actor, an actress for kids, I don't think in here it will be a problem. Yeah. But, but if you're like interacting directly with kids, like, you know, you teach. My, if it's glamour stuff, no. Like there's yeah. no spreads. No, I don't think it would be a problem. Right. Never um, heard of anything like that. It's, I know it's, it's crazy and I feel so bad for her, but there's nothing I can do. You know what I mean? Anyways. Um, wow. We, we are really going on some tangents. Okay. So <laughs> where were we? I think we are, we're both a type of person that, you know, <laughs> when you start talking, you totally go to another direction. <laughs> that's, uh, oh, no, it's, I mean, it's fine. Whatever. Again, it's my podcast. I do whatever the fuck I want. Yes. <laughs> um, Okay, so you're working for Rocco, and then oh, you came to America. That's that's where I we sent an, yeah. I sent an email to Mark Spiegler, mm. and he took me in his agency. How did, so how did you find out about Mark? I mean, I was a big fan of Sasha Gray before. 
So okay. I already knew he was his agent. And then Rocco told me he knew him. Mm-hmm. And that's how, you know, it went. I sent just I sent an email to him. It was like, I want to be like Bobby Star. Oh my Please god. That is a flashback. Yeah, I, I love her. I mean, my she's favorite a, was um, she's Australian, right? I don't is she know. the Australian girl, blonde I hair? Really watch movies. No, 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 no. I'm thinking of like a different. Okay, no, no, no. I know who you're talking about now. She's got dark hair. She's a brunette. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I was. There's like another Bobby something that we used to shoot all the time. Who was Australian, had blonde hair. Anyways. No, she, she was brunette. Yeah, yeah. I know who you're talking about now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So for those of you who don't know. Um, because his, his name comes up in my podcast a lot. So if you've listened to my podcast before, you know, but Mark Spiegler is probably the most coveted talent agent in the adult industry. And it's considered, um, quite an honor to be signed to his agency. And he's just like pretty much the most stand up dude in the industry. He cares about his girls, but in this like kind of gruff, tough love manner, which is nice. He's incredibly honest. Um, he's very ethical. And, uh, he's just like, you know, in, in a career where sometimes you get agents who aren't entirely forthcoming or who try to take advantage of the girls, um, or, you know, try to sleep with them. Um, Mark is the polar opposite of all of those things. So I think he, I mean, I, I haven't met him when he was younger, so I don't know, but I think people bother him so much. He became that way. (laughs) You know, I I gave him one time a problem. I was supposed to go to a location to get makeup done and then Mm -hmm. go to set. Mm -hmm. It was like really early in the morning. I was supposed to like, the call time was 11, but I had to be at the makeup place at Mm seven. So my mind was totally (laughs) confused. I ended up being stuck in the traffic for a long time because I went to the location first. Ah, okay. That was the only, I think the only problem I gave him. Then I never... Um, gave me actual problems but i know yeah. a lot of young especially young girls they will they will be relayed uh, so they don't show up or i mean of course you know when a girl acts like that then he usually he uh how you say like breaks drop the contract them. with them drop them yeah he'll, he'll drop you um uh, but we know they're also sometimes you know um directors are like that too you know, or yeah. things just get complicated on set because maybe you lose a photographer, so you lose a part of the crew. So he has to might maybe replace someone. So he, you know, it's just really hard to be an agent. I realized that. It's yeah. hard to oh go my to God. his house and try, you know, like to just chill with him because he's always on his phone. Yeah. I had him on the podcast once. You guys can actually go back and watch my episode with him and Jaden Valentina. And he only agreed to do the podcast if he could answer his phone during the interview. <laughs> and I was like, you know what, Mark? It's the only way I'm going to get you so fine. And he fucking totally did. <laughs> and actually the picture that I got, like, cause you know, I usually, well, when I was doing stuff live in studio, I would get a picture of me and my guests that I would use for the YouTube thumbnail. And it's him on his phone. And I was like, well, this is exactly who you are. So we may as well just use this footage. But um, yeah, it was, yeah, he was just like, well, I'll do the interview, but I'm, I'm not going to not answer my phone during the interview. And I was like, well, okay. Okay. So you, you contacted Spiegler. I'm assuming he took you on what kind of um, like, I know that he's, pr- he really tries to vet girls before he'll accept them. He wants to make sure that you know, you are really into what you're doing. I think as he puts it, he wants to make sure that you're a real pervert and you're not just in it for the money. I mean, I'm started with Rocco, so. Yeah, so I think that that was probably a good test. I mean, I never, I never started porn with the G. I was webcamming before. Mm-hmm. I was living alone already, which in Italy is not really common to be 20 years old and living alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, my boyfriend at the time was making more, I mean, now he's my husband, uh, making more money than me. So I was relying on him too. Uh, I never got into porn for the money. Also because I, I knew that was heavily pirated, how you say it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And, you know, now you have a way to make money directly with porn. Like, you know, I can right. use, uh, an amateur video and put it on, know, on OnlyFans or whatever. Mm-hmm. But before, you rather get successful 
Mm-hmm. Or are you just going to be not successful and live with the stigma that you did porn? Yeah. So it's like, and I, do and it. I was really aware of that when I started. Like I was totally, I decided to, I decided to risk everything. Like, mm-hmm. fuck, I want to do this. I, I don't care. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's porn's kind of one of those things, you know, you have these girls come and they like dip their toes in it. They do a handful of scenes and then they get out and then they find that they have the stigma that they have to fight for the rest of their life. And they never even really made it, you know, in the porn field to make that stigma worth it. So you said that you knew that you really wanted to do it. Why did you really want to do it? What was it about porn that really drew you to it? I st- I was studying fashion design when I got into porn. I did painting. I did ballet for eight years. I was always around art. And when I started uh, avant garde of the of the past centuries, I was feeling like porn was the really all in- uh, really the only interesting thing to do. There mm. was nothing, you know. It's kind of everything has been done in other categories i want Mm -hmm. to do porn and also uh i mean i haven't been this heavily slut shame because i mean i was fine but i always felt the obsession of society on sex and i was like this doesn't make any sense why are people like that why are they so obsessed why they have the phobia of sex Mm -hmm. why they judge people mostly based on sex instead of looking on other things like why you know we see someone and we immediately have to understand this person's heterosexual or or gay or if it's a female or a male like why are we like that then i learned you know there's some biology bio, biology biology reasons mm-hmm. uh but yeah i just ha- always hated irrationality Mm-hmm. So I you said there was something really. You said, there's so, you said there was biological reasons. What do you mean by that? Biological. Oh, that's the word that I was trying to. Biological. Yeah, it probably our brain does the in-group, out-group thing. So, mm-hmm. Sorry, I touched the microphone. Basically, uh, you know, before when we lived in a different type of society and we were living in forests and in small groups, probably it was safe for us to categorize people really fast. Animals do oh. that too. Yes, yes, So it was yes. probably a survival sk- uh, skill. And uh, also for reproduction, it's probably really important too. And yeah. So like- I think we still think about sex like we are in the jungle and we're going to, you know, mate and make kids. But that, that's not always the case when sex is just sex is just fun and we should totally separate from that reproduction mentality. Right. And especially girls. Like I, I was not how was like shaming, but I had friends telling me, Oh, you should not date three guys in, in, in the same week. They will call you a slut and nobody will want to date you again, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, listen, if a guy is that stupid and insecure, to judge me just because I do things that a guy will do. It's really a society where we have to work, we have to study, we, we do all the things men do. So let me have bisexual freedom too. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, then it's, it's not worth it. Like, I'd rather stay home and have someone working for me and making money for him. Like, it's not worth it anymore. Give me all the freedom of and the responsibility too, or no, no responsibility or no freedom. Like, let's go back to how it was before. Yeah. It's interesting what you brought up about how sex is like attached to reproduction. And that's, you know, how our lizard kind of brain mentality sees it. And I think that's true. I think that a lot of, you know, what brings about the slut shaming around women and suppressing of female sexual freedom comes from this archaic idea that, you know, you're just going to get you got to control female sexuality because unfortunately I think it's more like reading biology. I think it's more the other way around is more mm. feet because the sexual selection is done on men. So our female selecting guys. Mm-hmm. So I think guys, they have this mentality that if they don't do that, they will have hard time finding, like if you like sluts, they're going to have hard time finding a good partner. 
because uh-huh. lots just want to be sluts and you're probably too insecure, too jealous, you know, to get with the slut. So if you want to get a good girl, you have to agree with the good girls that slut shaming sluts. Mm-hmm. So it's a whole both biological and uh, culture mechanism. It's like the nature enforces the culture, the bad culture. Right, right. And if because... you look it into religions, it's the same. Which, I mean, I feel like Catholics were right in the past. They were trying to uh, do some type of uh, parental, uh, parenthood, parental control, how you say? Oh, like controlling the amount of children that people are having? Yeah, wait, you know, like if there were no, no tests, no birth control pills, no uh, condoms, the only way to don't have random kids that had, uh, that had the, no one to take care of them mm-hmm. will have to make sure couples stay together and yeah. made kids all inside the couple. So, you know, that, that was right. Uh, if mm-hmm. I was living in a different area, I would probably be a nun. Or, or a virgin or just a lesbian like a, secretly a lesbian i will definitely could not be a slut i could definitely yeah. not have sex with a thousand of people in my lifetime because i will not have the technology to do that yeah no that's what i was going to say so the fact that you know women there was no birth control that existed so it could be like kind of a more dangerous thing for the community and an economic problem because you couldn't control whether or not a woman got pregnant. So if she's sleeping around and having sex with a lot of different men and, you know, then you don't know who the father is. And so you can't assign responsibility to a particular person. And then a child is born in a situation where they can't really be supported. Um, that's an issue. It's interesting because I mean, really like kind of what we're getting into is about monogamy right now. And I had uh, Christopher Ryan on my podcast at the very beginning of my show who wrote Sex at Dawn. Have you read that? Sex? Well, Sex at Dawn? No. I think you'd really enjoy it. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating um, theory about how monogamy actually came up alongside agriculture. So the idea is that when we were nomadic groups, hunter-gatherers, Um, the idea of monogamy didn't really exist because people lived in like small communities and, you know, everybody could have sex with everybody because whatever child was born would be taken care of by that community. There was no sense of ownership. There was no ownership of land. So there was no such thing as like, you know, owning land, cultivating it, creating a surplus that would belong to you and become currency. Yeah, it's still real in some African uh, mm-hmm. yeah. places. People yeah, still so live it, like that. In some yeah, places. so it was an, no exactly monogamy. right, and it was so it was an egalitarian society where everybody shared everything. Right, everybody was equal. There was no like rich, poor, that kind of thing. And then when agriculture came along, I mean, I'm not it, sure about that. This is the like basic idea. I'm yeah. sure, you know, obviously, like it's it. It varies. Um, but uh, when agriculture came along and people started owning land and cultivating land and therefore creating like surpluses, then this idea of um, ownership of currency um, came along. And alongside that came the idea of passing your surplus or your goods or your riches on to your children, right? Well, then you wanted to make sure that your children were your children. They weren't somebody else's children. So that's where the idea of having one woman who only bore your children came along. You're and that's paying it. for somebody else's kids. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And that's where the idea of monogamy came along. So it's a really interesting book. Um, I, I'd highly recommend it. And if you guys want to go back and, and watch that interview with uh, Christopher Ryan, it's uh, one of my favorites because it's just uh we covered so many amazing topics, um, not just that, but tons of other stuff. And like, I love the intersection of science and sexuality. And uh, it's very you know. important because I wish uh, I knew all these things when I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't have suffered so much for nothing. Yeah. You know, when they say guys, they only want to have sex, even if they say they love you, but they just want to fuck. Mm-hmm. So at the time, I really believed that. I thought they were mean, 
you know, they, there was a tactic. There was, there was a way to, to have me in the bed and then leave me. But then I realized they actually think they are, when they say they love you, they probably actually think they're in love. Even if, you know, after they ha you have sex with them, they don't think of anymore. Mm -hmm. Like in that moment, they believe it. It's just because people confuse lust and love really easy. Yeah. And guys, basically, they, they are in love when they're horny, when they're attracted by a woman. And girls, they, uh, they get in love when, when they come. And that was that type. I would like fell in love with any guys who was able to make me come. Yeah. There's a specific hormone that your body releases as a woman when you come that, that attaches you to whoever your partner is supposedly at the time. Um, but I'm glad you brought that topic up because actually that leads me to another question I wanted to ask you about, which is your relationship with your husband and working in this industry. But first we're going to go to a commercial break. Okay. And so hang tight guys. We'll be right back. Summer is here and Manscaped is here to help you level up your full body grooming game. Their lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer. It's cordless, it's waterproof, and it is guaranteed not to nick or snag your nuts. And if you want to use it on your chest hair, it actually has different settings so you can get the perfect length, whether or not you're the kind of guy who likes to be a little bearish or maybe actually wants a bare chest, literally. You can get all of this inside the perfect package where you will find the crop preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer, as well as the crop reviver, a testy toner that is designed to give you a pep in your step. If you subscribe to the perfect package, you will get a blade refill for your lawnmower trimmer delivered to your door every three months. So what are you waiting for? Make this your best and most hairless summer ever. Go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. That's manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. So speaking of monogamy, um, you are married and you've been with this man for a long time. So most people cannot wrap their head around the idea of somebody who could be married and then also work in the adult industry. So how does your relationship work within those parameters? So when I met my boyfriend, I was, I mean, my actual husband, we have been married for two days. So mm -hmm. I, I'm still getting, uh, you've been married idea. for two days. Wait, you got married two days ago. Yeah. Oh my God. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations. Oh, thank you. So cool. Yeah. We've been in, together 11 years mm -hmm. and, uh, we moved into the, the we moved into the, this new house. And during quarantine, we just realized, oh, we should get married because we're going to have more rights. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just going to be better. So 
you know. Yeah, the government. In our families, so we just decided to get married. <laughs> something happened to each other. I mean, to one of us. It's yeah. Just, uh, for taxes, yeah, yeah. for a lot of things. It's just that yeah. so we decided to get married. But I mean, we just explained that if you think about it, sex and love are two different things. Mm-hmm. I never, at the time, I didn't know, but I was still separating lust and love. Even though sometimes, you know, I will fall in love when I was coming. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and then you do, I did porn and now I can fall in love anytime I shoot. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's still just lust. Uh, for me, love is something else. It's something that you build with a person and is based on on values and things you share together. Of course, it has an irrational part that has to do with just liking each other and just have two different characters that, no, I, I don't think it's the right word, uh, personalities mm-hmm. that work well together and you can decide that. But what you can work on is being honest with, with yourself and honest with other people. So when you're dating, uh, you know what you're looking for. And if the other person is honest too, things go so much smooth. And that's mm-hmm. just what happened to me and my boyfriend. I mean, he told me I love you the second day we met. And that was just, this is another guy just when I have sex. I'm like, and I told him, listen, you don't have to tell me I love you. I'll have sex with you anyway. Like, <laughs> and they'll say, oh, no, I can see uh, each other married and, you know, have this like old couple type of conversation. And now we're here 11 years after. Wow. And yeah, I never understood jealousy and I always hated, I could never stand a jealous person. So actually I never had a true boyfriend before him mm-hmm. um, because I didn't, I was, even when I met him, I wasn't looking for a boyfriend. Mm-hmm. I want to have someone like a friend with benefits, but mm-hmm. they also, you know, okay, we have sex, but we can also have fun because mm-hmm. in Italy people tend to separate get girls from bad girls so you don't you don't bring the bad girls around you don't show your the bad girls to your friends it's like oh you have sex and then that's it you can't you can be friends with it Mm -hmm. with them uh now you know that i'm older things are different or maybe it's it's because i do porn so i just attract different type of people but when i was a teenager uh i was feeling lonely but it's Still not at the point that I will like give up my values and start mm-hmm. to, you know, like give up my sexual freedom because people were behaving that way around me. So I was like, mm-hmm. no, I'm, I'm just going to do what guys do. Fuck it. Like when I will meet a guy smart enough to accept that, then maybe I'll have a relationship. Otherwise, I'm good alone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the most... I think one of the keys to entering into a successful relationship, at least this was the case for me, is that you have to be okay with you by yourself first Um, and and be comfortable in not needing another person to like make you whole. I think the uh, changing your mentality from like, oh, I need a partner to make myself whole to a partner would help complement my life. I think that's really healthy. And and I had reached that point when I met my husband and, you know, to this day, like, and I love him so much, like more than I've ever loved anybody else. Thank God. Cause we're having a baby together. <laughs> yes. But, um, you know, I, he's everything to me, but if he left me tomorrow, I would be devastated. I would be so devastated, but my life would not be over. I would get over it. I would move on with my life and I would be okay. And I would, I feel that way now about with anybody. And I never felt that way before. And I think that that kind of attitude is what allowed me to find somebody like him and enter into like a really healthy relationship. that's yeah. not codependent. Same with me. The only thing that will, like, I always say I can live without him, but mm-hmm. I cannot live in a world where he doesn't exist. Mm. He is the you, most open-minded person I've ever met. And I've been in bed with a thousand of people. That, that's a, I think that's a good uh, recommendation. They didn't fuck a thousand people <laughs> before you get married. Yeah. Uh, 
Because you have to understand what you really want, you know. God, that is so true because my ex-husband, who I met before, I remember when I met him, he was like, yeah, I've only been with seven women. And I remember, like, probably most women would be like, oh, good. Like, you know, I'm glad that he didn't sleep around so he feels more exclusive. But for me, I was like, oh, no, that's terrible. Yeah, it is. That's terrible. Whereas, like, my current husband is like, he won't even tell me what his number is. He probably doesn't even know. But I'm like, I'm so glad that you fucked tons of women. <laughs> like, yeah. Because you're right. You, you're experienced. You know what you want. And also, too, like, you kind of get it out of your system. Yeah. And I mean, besides, well, I was thinking I was trying to say something else. Oh, yeah. He was he's the most open-minded person. I've met so many people, but he's still the most open-minded person I've ever met. Mm-hmm. And I've known him for 11 years. And the stuff he says still surprise me sometimes. You know, of course, I know him really well. So most of the time we'll say something and I'm expecting him to say something like that. Mm -hmm. But there's still like at least once a day, he will say something that I'm not expecting to come out of his mouth. Wow. Yeah. Can you give me an example? No, because it's so smart. I Uh, I will have to (laughs) think about it. Okay. I, re- I have to like think about it. Maybe I'll, I'll I don't know. I'll, I'll, I should have a record and then send to you later. I don't know if that makes sense. It's just like he has a different opinion. You know, like an issue will come up, you know, like politics, mm-hmm. whatever. And they will show me a totally different point of view that no one is right. talking about it. You know, another perspective. So it opens to, you know, more questions and more answers. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I get that from my husband as well. And I think, I assume that your husband doesn't work in the adult industry and mine doesn't either. He would like to, but he's not that good as performing. Uh, now that, you know, we've been quarantined. Uh, mm-hmm. I've shot only a few scenes in July in Paris. Mm-hmm. Now Paris is in lockdown. So oh, okay. that's your just thing. And no one can get in or out of the city. Um but I haven't yeah, I haven't shot with anyone because I mean I'm not scared of coronavirus. I just don't feel like doing it and just helping the spread of the virus. I will feel kind of guilty. Yeah. Uh, so I'm I really miss shooting with other people. Uh right. I, I love my husband, but sometimes, you know, I just <laughs> want to do something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, it will, you know, it will also inspire me more to shoot. Uh, so we have been, you know, he has been having ideas about shooting stuff. Uh, so it's kind of, he wants to maybe shoot with other girls. We, we will see. I mean, it, yeah. it's up to the other girls, not up to me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and so I was saying also, we are an open couple regardless of porn. Uh, he can have sex with whoever he wants and same thing for me. And then, so how does that work for you guys? Like, do you guys openly communicate about if you're going to go have sex with somebody else or is it just a situation of like, you do that and it doesn't matter if you mention it or not? Both, uh, for instance, you know, if I'm traveling for work and then I don't know, have sex uh, with a performer privately, uh, sometimes I forget to say it. Uh, but you know, if he calls me because, you know, we hear each other and I'm with somebody else, I'll just tell like, Hey, I'll call you later. Um, mm-hmm. I'm having sex with this person or uh, I'll mention it is really, is like, Oh honey, I went, you know, I went to the store and I bought, I bought something. It's kind of the same <laughs> thing is, it's not a big deal. Right. You right. Know, as long as we, we're both safe. You know, mm-hmm. we, we both take precautions of what we're doing. But that's mm-hmm. that. That's the only thing. I, I can, yeah. I'm a true cuckold. I I get turned on by seeing him having sex with other girls, but I have to like the girl. Like she has to be hot. Mm-hmm. Sometimes he fucks chicks I don't like. I'm like, just fuck it, fuck her by yourself. I, I'm not attracted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm gonna fuck this one. <laughs> yeah. Like last time that we had the treason, I mean, we didn't have a treason because. I think the first time we did, kind of, but I was not really attracted. So, okay, I'll, he he loves to like have sex with the girls and then come into me. He's obsessed with cream pie. He he never came okay. in my face. Really? <laughs> so, yeah. Is 
it's just like that. It, it hates to like interrupt the or the the. Fight. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I understand. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Uh, I have to do it manually. So yeah, he always likes to come inside me. So I I tell him I feel used. Like you have sex with the other girl, but then because you want to come inside, you call me. <laughs> You only call me for the cream pies. And I'm like, I'll, I'll do it. The tre- you know, I love treasons, but I have to like the girl. Like with dicks, yeah. girl, I can still use the dick, but with the girl, I have to be into the girl. So how, how do you, I mean, obviously you're into women and into men. How, what is it about women that you, that you really like? Like you say you have to be into the girl. What, what kind of girls are you into? I like curvy girls. I mean, I can be into skinny girls if they're really dirty. Like, mm. I love Emily Willis, for instance. Yeah, she's, she's skinny, great. She's so nasty. I, and she's also younger than me. Usually, you know, they have to be at least the same age or older. Uh, but she's so great that, you know, I, I don't care. But what, what I really like is girls that in bed don't say anything. They don't have requests. And Italian, Italian girls are a lot like that. Mm. And I feel like... And I had actually, I had one time I had sex with a model. It was probably the, one of the most beautiful guy I've ever seen in my life. And he was the roast fuck of my life. <laughs> At the point that I cried after. And I think he thought he was in love. I'm like, no, you don't understand. You're just the biggest sex disappointment of my life. <laughs> did he and- just like not, did he not try? Was he, because I've, I've had sex with a couple of like, and there was this one guy that I was dating once who was like so gorgeous and had this like incredible penis. And yeah, he was the most boring lay ever. And I feel like it was just because he feels like he doesn't have to try because he's so like good looking, you know, that he can just skate hey, by on he his had look. A good penis. Mine had a really ugly penis. Like he How was, was really ugly. It was a really ugly. Like he was so good looking, but then his penis was horrible. It was like, okay, I mean, you can't be perfect. And then he was complaining because I was asking him, I was telling him what to do. I was like, hey, I don't like the hand in that way. Can you lick it this way? Like, hey, you're rough with that beer. I was I was say, telling him in a nice way, you know, it's not yeah. that way. And he was complaining about that. He was complaining that I, I had the requests. And then, I re- you know, when I look, girls, I have sex with my boyfriend. I like, I realized that's just Italian culture is because... If you have requests in bed, you are a bad girl. So we are just not used to to talk while, and I'm I'm not a big talker as performer too. It's, um, dirty talking is it's really hard for me, and it's probably because you know in the past I always had sex without saying yeah, anything. Yeah. Right. I'll give you direction, but I have a hard time saying sexy things uh, while I have sex. Do you think that you're able to give people direction and you have those communication skills because you work in porn, because we so heavily rely on communication in our industry or were you always like that? No, I was always like that because okay. you know, I'm having sex for me and I'm not having sex for you. So if I don't care, yeah. what's the point? I'll leave. Yeah. Yeah. And that's probably helped you in the industry because there are a lot of girls who have a hard time communicating what they like and what they don't like. And then they end up getting stuck in a situation where they do a scene that they did things they didn't want to do, but they didn't know how to speak up about it. Yeah. But that's their personal problem. That's no porn bro. And I say, I think those type of people should, they're not mature enough to be informed. Their sexuality mm-hmm. is not mature enough to be informed. Unfortunately, we don't have a way to select girls before and also, why is always the girl a girl's problem guys have this problem too it's just because they don't speak up how many times mm-hmm. they get their dick bitten mm-hmm. their dicks bitten i'm sure it happens a lot of time it's just because we live in this society where you know for girls it's easy to play the victim and the guys they cannot complain they cannot say anything otherwise they're not tough Right. No one is tweeting, yeah. oh, bitch, you bit my dick on set. <laughs> I'm going to cancel you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. And it's interesting. I had this, I had Karen Lee on a couple of episodes ago and we talked about that because we are very hyper-focused on the female experience. And if women feel like they've been taken advantage of or if women have a bad experience, but we forget 
that, you know, men also have boundaries and they have, you know, likes and dislikes and that they have issues and that that should also be discussed, which is why communication just on set, like, you know, as a producer is something that's so important to me and something I'm really trying to get better at and just making sure that everybody's really on the same page about it. Yeah, everything. but at the same time, I think it's making porn lame. When I started, mm. I have a video that I, uh, a scene that I shot with Doc Part where uh, I'm trying to lick two performer asses. Uh, one is Rigo Strong, I don't remember the name of the other performer. And, you know, if it was on today's set, I think, you know, it would be different. But at the time, because we were, we were talking about boundaries so much, I felt okay doing it. And it became funny because those big, tall, muscled men were running around scared of me because I was <laughs> trying to lick their assholes. <laughs> and it's all in the scene and it's hilarious. Like they could like pick me up and move <laughs> and run away. And now I, I feel I can't, I cannot do that on set. I want yeah. people to push my boundaries and I want to push other people's boundaries. I think that's healthy for our sexual life. Mm -hmm. But now we cannot do it because we have this mentality that, oh, I'm not into that. It's like with food, you know, with people like, oh, no, I don't, I don't like pineapple on my pizza. I will never try that. You know, mm -hmm. it's, that's like, like, let me put it on your face, please. <laughs> then you can, you can, you know, slap me. That's fine. I'll take that reply, but at least let me, let me try it. And I though, try it. Yeah, though I feel like there's a distinct difference between pineapple and, I don't know, maybe double anal. <laughs> I mean, double anal is, you know, when things have to do with pain, I yeah. totally understand. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah I've, uh, one time in a, it was, it was like a mini gangbang with three guys in Europe. One guy, he was trying to make me squirt from the ass. And I'm like, dude, you're just hurting uh, my skin. That's, that's, that's painful. I was telling him, I don't know if he was not understanding because my English was shit and it was French. Mm -hmm. At one point, I just started to spit in his face. Mm -hmm. Wow. Like, dude, if you do it again, I'm just going to uh, kick your balls. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's, you know, it's fine. It's, I, only one time I had the guy slapping my clit really hard. And then I, when I, I was, he was like sitting on my face. And then when I stand up, I slap him in his face and his stick didn't get hard for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only, you know, like kind of bad situation I had. I felt like I shouldn't have slapped in the face. He was accused then by a bunch of girls. Um, mm -hmm. So I kind of felt okay doing it. I didn't regret it so much. And yeah, and you should not get violent on set. You know, even if someone did something bad to you, you should not start the fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but at the same, I rather have that that this you know lame situation we have right now. Like it's okay to talk about content and stuff, but also let's get in the mentality of being more open about new things. Yeah. Well, I think that that's where we can look to people like uh, companies like Kink, who I know are very, have very explicit um, boundary stipulations and also the ability for people to really explore their sexuality and try things that they're afraid of. So I've talked to quite a few people who, you know, have, have worked on those sets and I know you've worked for Kink a lot. And they have no, no, these no, no. like. I have worked for Kink a lot. I only shot for a few things for Kinks. Because oh, I really? Yeah, I only done, oh. only done everything but and fucking machines. That's it. Okay. And okay. they do a lot of bondage, and I'm just not into it. It's not your thing. Right, right, right. So, so what, what I really liked is their, what I've heard about these really um, complex, oh, complex is not really the right word, uh, really detailed consent forms where you have, you know, uh, something, let's say anal, right? Let's give an example. Yeah, it's basically anal. part of the contract. Yeah, like how do you feel about anal, yes or no? And then also like not even just a yes or no, but like it's a one scale of ten, one to five. 10. Exactly. Like, uh, you know, 10 absolutely love anal, 
It's my favorite thing in the world. One being don't go near my butt. I can't stand it. And then an ability to write into comments. So maybe if you put in like a five, you can be like, well, you know, I've, I've tried it once, but I didn't have a good experience. I'd be open to trying it again under these circumstances. So it allows this conversation to open up about, okay, um, I, I'm not into this, or I don't think I'm into this, but I, I'm willing to give it a shot, or like I don't want to go there at all. And then so when you have that information, I think that's really helpful to create a space where people can work within those boundaries and then and then explore their sexuality, like you said. Um, but also, you know, everyone can respect wherever their hard nose are. And I think that that's something that the mainstream adult industry has been kind of lacking severely, I think, because, you know, BDSM is so intense and there's so many like different things that you can do with it that when you were shooting quote unquote, like vanilla scenes, you know, one feels like we don't need to have this explicit yeah. consent form. But I think in some cases with some girls and some guys that would have really helped the scene come out better. And it would have, that level of communication would have prevented some of the problems that we've seen. I will do it on video and also with actually trying, for instance, if you're spanking, like try the one to 10 and say, okay, this is okay. Um, but sometimes so much explanation kills the energy and the feeling. Yeah. So, and it's boring to fill up a contract that long about your boundaries. Like, let's be honest. Like maybe if you get horny on set after not horny anymore. <laughs> yes, yeah. But you don't think like, cause I was talking to, was it Alison Bowden, who's the CEO of kink or, or someone else? I think it was her. And she said that, that generally people fill out these contracts and they actually put it like in a database. And so if, so you just do it once and then obviously they oh. check in with you to see if things have changed. But when you come in again, they like have this database of like what you're okay with. And so they already know what kind of scenes to book you in, who to book you with. Because I think once you get that out of the way, don't you think that like people are more comfortable to enjoy? Yeah, scene? maybe every every performer should have should have one pre-made for every set. Right. And then you yeah. know, decide based on the type of shoot, do it's like, okay, but today we're doing that type of scene but here are my boundaries. If we do any extra, you're just going to pay me extra. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> yeah. It's just, I, I, I know what you mean. I do think that there are definitely people in porn that it's, this is probably not the right industry for them. Um, but you know, yeah, there's, a, I mean, there's a lot of them right now. Yeah. So especially for me as a producer and also dealing, you know, sometimes with people who just don't understand how to state their boundaries and they don't know how to, um, you know, be assertive about what they like and what they don't like. I mean, obviously you're a strong woman, so you've never had a problem with that. But when we have to deal with sometimes like these young girls that just don't know any better, like we have to really try to navigate that space and make sure that we're providing a safe environment for them and we're not pushing them beyond their boundaries. But, you know, I mean, if I shoot a girl and I, I really feel like she didn't really want to be there, she didn't really want to do this, like I'm not going to book her again because I'll yeah. just be like, this is not the right place for you. You know? So, um, and I think that that's what makes people like you so successful because this is the right place for you. You know, like clearly you love your job. Clearly you love, um, sex, you love porn. And I think the fans see that too. You know, the fans can tell when you're really into it. And that I think is a huge part in what makes you a successful porn star. Yeah. Even though I didn't know any of that when I started, like I had an idea, but I, I didn't know. So it's, you know, when you start a career is always, uh, also, because right now there are some thanks to social media, there are some girls. I feel like they're not really into porn, but they became really famous through social media. So you know, I mean, they're not shoot much mainstream anymore because they're mostly doing all events and stuff. Right. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, there and there's you know, porn is so many different things. There's different kinds of porn that you can do that fits in whatever is comfortable for you. And um, if doing mainstream porn is not 
for you, then yeah. you've got OnlyFans and and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, there's helps. a lot of options. There's a lot of options for people, I think, for sure. So, well, thank you so much, Valentina. This is uh, this has been really fun. You've got an interesting guest. You just time flies by. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, I always loved you. Uh, oh, thank so. you. Oh, shucks. Oh. Well, I, I adore you too. And honestly, to this day, that stuff that I shot of you for twisties, like in the flat with the flowers in the bathtub and then that old car, oh, remember? Oh, those are some of my favorite photos of all time. So you're an incredible model. You're so much fun to work yeah, with. Yeah, you have between the best picture. Uh, there's only the guy who shot me for Penthouse. They shot really good pictures too. Is that the one where you've got the cover and you're yeah. like the mechanic? Yeah, that's yeah. a great photo of you. Yeah. That, that that's was a really that good one. one. That's one of my Clive favorite. Clive McLean. Was it Clive McLean? No. No, he would work his name. Player. But I heard he died. Oh, Stephen. Was it Stephen Hicks? I think he was. If he died, yes. It must be that guy. Yeah. Well, Clive McLean and Stephen Hicks have both died, unfortunately. Oh, wow. Well, okay. But I think Clive only worked for Hustler. Um, and I know, uh, Steve worked for penthouse. So yeah, it was probably, he was like a blonde surfer guy. Yeah. Yeah. Th yeah. That was, um, that was, that was really sad when he passed away. He was really talented and it was a really sudden death too. That was like completely unexpected. So eh, rest in peace, Stephen Hicks. Um, anyways, uh, can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? So right now I have three accounts on on, on Instagram because they don't want to reply to me and they're always taking down my stuff. But my main one is Insta Valentina Nappi. And if I get deleted, it's Valentina Nappi. Hopefully they won't both get deleted. And I'm verified on Twitter and I'm is Valenappi uh, the tag. Uh, but if you Google Valentina Nappi, uh, no, sorry, if you, go, if you search Valentin up on Twitter, you will find me. But you have to, uh, you have in your settings, you have to say that you agree to view sensitive material because, of course, I do porn, so uh, it's only for 18 plus. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they can't find me at all, and that happen. That's that happens for a lot of uh, a lot of girls in the industry and guys. Yeah. Like if you respect I've, the rules, they you're kind of shadow banned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same for me. I'm shadow banned as well. Even though I'm very careful about what I put on my timeline, I don't put anything explicit, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I found actually the best way to get around that because I'm always tagging people, you know, when like podcast episodes come out or whatever. If you go to Google and you Google, not in Twitter, but you Google Valentina Nappy Twitter, usually that will give you the correct account. Yeah. Same with like Valentina Nappy Instagram, but you have to go outside of the app and actually use Google to find you. Um, so because if Google you, yeah, because if you search within the app, they'll usually give you all the fake accounts. Mm -hmm. It's really irritating. So, um, and then do you have a website? Yeah, I mostly use OnlyFans now too. So okay. it's OnlyFans, so Valentina Nappy or Valentina Nappy, you'll, you'll find me. This is the same one. Okay, same. Yeah. And then I'm all, you know, I'm all the sites, uh, Model Hub, Pornhub, many vids. You can find me everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> Just search for me. <laughs> and you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. If you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Thank you guys so much for watching and we will see you next week. Manscaped is here to up your body grooming game. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that will not only not nick or snag your nuts, but can also be used on your chest hair. If you get it in the Perfect Package 3.0, it will come with a bunch of liquid formulas to keep you feeling and smelling fresh all day. And for a limited time, you can also get a free travel bag and anti chafing boxer briefs that come with it. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping.